Good morning and welcome to worship here at Victoria Methodist Church in Canesham. A warm welcome to anyone visiting us for the first time and for those worshipping with us via the video link, welcome. Our fellowship will continue after the service with tea and coffee and this is served at the rear of the church. Everyone is welcome and we hope that you will join us. We have just a moment's quiet before we say together the prayer of preparation, which you can follow on the screen. We say together, we reflect in this week after Easter Day, the joy of last Sunday and the powerful truth Jesus has conquered death. Easter is a beginning, not an ending. It is the fresh start all of our hearts long for. The cross, the empty grave, and the resurrected Jesus not only give us a reason to hope for change, they give us the power to change. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Amen. Our worship this morning will be led by the Reverend David Musgrave and it is my pleasure on your behalf to welcome David and to invite him to lead us in worship. Thank you, David. Good morning, friends. Good to be here. I was just remembering the last time I was in this building with you was, was before COVID, so I've sort of forgotten my way around. So it's good to be back in this, this wonderful old building on the high street. And it's wonderful to join together in worship and our opening words are from the psalmist, one of those songs of ascents, the songs probably pilgrims shared in as they went up to the temple, looking forward to their worship in fellowship and in company. Psalm 133, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. It's like costly anointing oil flowing down head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. Do we always come to worship with that joy in our hearts? Let us hope so and let us pray that God will keep us on that way of fellowship together fellowship in God's love, God's joy, and God's hope. So we're going to join together as we sing the hymn number 148, Come, let us with our Lord arise.
let us pray together. Let us pray. Loving God, we come together with joy. We come because you have called us, because we have felt the need to be together, together in celebration, together to mark our joys and also our sorrows, as we mark the joys and sorrows of the whole world that you have created. We are called by your love, because we know that that love is what is most needed in today's world. We come in your hope, because we know that people in their despair and desolation are crying out for a sense of your purpose for the world. We come amidst the new life of spring, with lambs in the fields, buds and leaves on our trees and hedges, a time to recognise the wonder and beauty of your creation. And as we look around us, as we see that beauty, as we wonder at your goodness, so we are forced to pause Pause as we realise the pain and suffering that is so often hidden as much as it may be in plain view. We have been tempted sometimes to turn away from our television screens when news from the world seems to be more awful than ever. We turn in on ourselves, afraid to face the changing climate and all its effects on the world around us. Or we resort to despair. We begin to lose our faith in your purpose. Forgive us, Lord, Forgive us for those times when we turn away. Forgive us for those times when we give up. Forgive us for those times when we turn our backs on the needs of our neighbours. Renew hope in us. Renew faith and love in us that we may go from this place in continued service of you as we serve your people wherever they may be. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The world was dark at Easter, when Easter to the dark world came, fair flowers glowed like scarlet flame. We sing the hymn number 316.
I'm sorry, I immediately threw a spanner in the works by bringing the hymn in too early. So we're going to hear the three readings all together. I had originally intended to split them up. We're going to hear three very different readings. They are the appointed lessons, all from the New Testament for today. Starting with a passage from Acts, which is one of those passages that has intrigued people through the centuries as to what the meaning of it and what the consequences of it were and are to be. Then we're going to hear the opening part of John's first letter, in which John sets out his letters in some ways encapsulate the much longer text of the Gospel. And the first chapter of John's first letter parallels the first chapter of his Gospel, very much presenting the themes, if you like, the theological, the, the global, the universal themes of what Easter actually means. And after both of those, we'll come to the Gospel reading from John, which is a familiar reading, one of Jesus' first appearances after the resurrection. And again, one of the most challenging, one of those that really makes us think. So, Acts, then the first letter of John, then John's Gospel. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The whole company of believers was united in heart and soul. Not one of them claimed any of his possessions as his own. Everything was held in common. With great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and all were held in high esteem. There was never a needy person among them because those who had property in land or houses would sell it, bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the feet of the apostles to be distributed to any who were in need. So from the first letter of John. It was there from the beginning, we have heard it. We have seen it with our own eyes. We have looked upon it and felt it with our own hands. Our theme is the word which gives life. This life was made visible. We have seen it and bear our testimony. We declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made visible to us. It is this which we have seen and heard that we declare to you in order that you may share with us in a common life, the life which we share with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are right in this in order that our joy may be complete. Here is the message we have heard from him and pass on to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to be sharing in his life while we go on living in darkness, our words and our lives are a lie. But if we live in the light as he himself is in the light, then we share a common life and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all our sin. If we claim to be sinless, we are self-deceived, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is just, and may be trusted to forgive our sins, and cleanse us from every kind of wrongdoing. If we say we have committed no sin, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in us. 
My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does, we have in Jesus Christ one who is acceptable to God and will please our cause with the Father. He is himself a sacrifice to atone our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. World. So John chapter 20. Late that same day, the first day of the week, when the disciples were together behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he showed his hands and his side. On seeing the Lord, the disciples were overjoyed. Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you pronounce them unforgiven, unforgiven they remain. One of the twelve, Thomas the twin, was not with the rest when Jesus came. So the others kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Unless I see the marks of the nails on his hands, unless I put my finger into the place where the nails were, and my hand into his side, I will never believe it. A week later, his disciples were once more again in the room, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Be unbelieving no longer but believe. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have found faith. Happy are they who find faith without seeing me. There were indeed many other signs that Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Those written here have been recorded in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this faith you may have life by his name. Amen. Thank you. Demelting Thomas. After 2,000 years, Thomas has never been able to shake off that epithet. They go together. And when we, perhaps thoughtlessly even today, put the word doubting in front of Thomas, what does it mean? What does it suggest? Is it suggesting somebody less committed than the other disciples? Is it suggesting somebody less ready to take at face value what others say? Thomas is a convenient figure to people throughout history who have tried to impose a pattern of belief on the church or on the world. Insisting that you have to believe certain things to qualify as one of the team. 
suggesting that doubting, uncertainty, questioning have no place if we're going to call ourselves true Christians. Well, those of you who know me well enough will not be surprised to hear that I don't share that picture of Thomas. Rather the opposite. Thomas is something of a role model for me. And I think he is a role model for our present age. Millions of Christians in India to this day in the Martoma church follow the tradition that after the resurrection it was Thomas who brought the gospel to India making us humbly aware that a country like India has deeper Christian roots than our own country. Of course Thomas wasn't alone we remember how the other disciples found the first stories of the resurrection difficult to accept particularly when it was the women who brought these stories after all who would trust the word of mere women for whatever reason Thomas wasn't present at those first meetings, that first time when Jesus showed himself to the other disciples. They had had the opportunity to encounter the risen Christ. And they shared the story. So Thomas heard the story from him, from them. Now one of the the great arts I think in our Christian life is trying to put ourselves in the place of people in the Bible and I don't think you have to pause very long if you put yourself in Thomas's position at that point in his life to understand exactly where he's coming from doesn't it make sense to hear something as totally unbelievable having gone through all the trauma of Good Friday and to be told, to be asked to believe at second hand that this man whom you have seen die on Good Friday has somehow returned to life. Wouldn't you be sceptical just as Thomas was? He's not somebody to be, to be persuaded by words however fervent they are, however full of, full of life these witnesses are, however strong their stories seem to be. And yet this same Thomas, who would not be persuaded by words, when he is faced with the reality, he is brought to that most devout of affirmations when he says, my Lord and my God. There is a moment in which all that skepticism, all that doubt in his mind is put aside because he is faced, he comes face to face with the risen Christ. Because his hesitation hasn't been based on any kind of unwillingness, but it's been based on the difficulty of getting his head round the whole idea which is surely where we come in how often do we find ourselves in that situation of being faced with something so so preposterous so outlandish so far beyond our normal human means of understanding that we can't take it we blink we shut our eyes, we turn our back perhaps. It's about a thousand years ago now, Saint Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke of faith-seeking understanding. 
And that's a phrase that has stuck with me over the years. Faith seeking understanding. Faith not saying, now I've got it, I know it all. Faith that is leading me through life. Trying to make sense of it, seeking. Seeking understanding of who God is and therefore what life is all about. Faith is being committed to a journey, a journey in which we ask questions, a journey in which we work through our doubts, and in which we hope by the end of it to have some sense of the meaning and purpose of God. A particular hero of mine in the contemporary world of faith is Richard Holloway, one time Bishop of Edinburgh, but parted ways with the church in later life. He posed the question, what is the opposite of faith? Think about that for a moment. As a quiz question, what is the opposite of faith? Anybody want to offer a word that, that you would say was the opposite of faith? Disbelief? Atheism? Doubt? Certainty, I hear from somewhere. If we have certainty, we think we've arrived. We think we know it all. And if we have certainty, there's no room left for faith. There's no journeying left. If the church demands certainty, if the, demand, if the church demands that you tick a whole number of boxes before you are admitted, before you are recognized as a follower of Jesus, then the church encourages dishonesty, as I think in many ways it has through the centuries. It's encouraged people to claim something because they feel they are supposed to. And suppress the questions that come naturally. Faith seeking understanding, spending our whole lives on that journey. So, to my mind, I agree absolutely with Richard Holloway that certainty is the biggest obstacle to faith, that sense of having arrived. So, at Easter time, we grapple with the mystery of the resurrection. We may, and in some churches, even if they don't recite the creeds through the year, they will recite the creed at this particular time. And I'm not denigrating the creeds as such because they have powerful language and I think it's important often to share that language together. But the, the creeds, as we know them today, were pulled together by church leaders in the third or fourth centuries to try to agree common ground, to try to impose unity in the belief that if you have everybody believing the same things, you will have a united church and a united society. Can we have that sense of unity? Or on what kind of ground is that kind of unity founded? Of course we can tie ourselves in knots trying to work out exactly what happened in those first days and weeks after the first Easter. And it's worth reminding ourselves that there are the differences even between the four Gospels. There are disagreements from the earliest time about exactly what happened and in what sequence and in what way. And of course, 2,000 years later, the short answer is that we cannot know. There is, not no, there is no way we can humanly 
intellectually know the sequence of events at and after that first Easter. But more important, much more important than that, is that we don't need to. We don't need to know the historic facts, the historic sequence of events of those days. In fact, I'll go further than that. I think pursuing the quest to know is a distraction from what our faith is actually to be about. And this is where I want to bring in those other two readings that we heard. Because they both provide some kind of an inkling into what I believe we are called to be as church. That little scene from Acts chapter 4, which not only people of faith, but people of many philosophical traditions have toyed with through the centuries. The scene of an ideal community of sharing, in which people pooled their wealth, they sold property and brought the proceeds and laid it at the feet of the disciples to alleviate poverty. It's above all an important picture to us in our world today, isn't it? And again, I don't think we need to be too preoccupied with the literal story. It's the idea behind it. It's obvious anyway that it didn't last. It's probable that it was only happening in the first place when people were assuming that the, the end of things, the return of Jesus, the end of the world in some way, was going to happen in their lifetimes and therefore personal possessions wouldn't play any role anymore. But the underlying message is to us all as an ideal of how human society needs to operate if it's truly going to follow the way of God's purpose. And the opening chapter of John's first letter, from the same stable as the gospel, if it was not the same writer, it was somebody closely aligned with John the Evangelist. And those words give evidence of the difference that faith in God makes in our daily life. That sense of the light shining through. That sense of something driving us to do things that perhaps don't come naturally to us as human beings. Because in the end, what matters about being followers of Jesus is not about straining our mind, straining our intellect, to believe things that are beyond belief. What matters is how lives are changed. Lives of individuals, lives of communities, lives of the world. Changed by the force of the resurrection. Whether it's fishermen in the first century in Galilee, whether it's miners in 18th century England hearing the word preached by the Wesleys and the early Methodists, whether it's slaves on American plantations stealing away to sing their spirituals together and to share that vision of a free society. Dalits in India in our own time oppressed by caste restrictions. And each of us, from so many different backgrounds that we come, haven't we each in some way known the liberating effect of the resurrection? Hasn't each of our lives in some way been changed? by our questioning, by our sharing our stories, sharing our uncertainties, sharing our life of faith together, we are enabled to reach out. Reach out into the world 
with those big questions of injustice and suffering, why God allows it all. The big questions about why we are here and about what life is all about. As we share our life together as a church, as God's people, we live as Easter people. We live in the light of the resurrection. In a reflection of that early model of sharing, inspiring ourselves and inspiring the world around to follow that model, helping others to see something of God's love in what we stand for and in how we live. So Thomas is a model. He's a model for a life of faith lived out in the real world with all its imperfections. Life in which we recognize our limitations. We recognize the degree to which we cannot get our heads round the big issues. And yet the inspiration to each of us to put God's love at the center of our lives. That we may be the agents, we may be the people, the means through, through which God's love becomes a reality for the whole of humanity by which God's purposes are brought to fruition, by which God's kingdom comes. Amen. This joyful Easter tide, what need is there for grieving? We sing the hymn number 340. <laughs>
a prayer of dedication of our offering. Generous God, you who have given us any, everything, you who gave yourself for us, so we bring our gifts day by day, week by week, as a response in love. And as we bring our gifts of money, we ask that you will use not only these gifts, but that you will use us as we are body, mind and spirit in the service of your kingdom, make a, making a reality of your love throughout the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. We continue with our prayers of intercession. Loving God, we share the pain of the world. We are more and more conscious of how much suffering there is. The suffering of conflict. As we hear the ever more terrible stories coming from Gaza of human inflicted suffering. As we remember the people of Rwanda on the 30th anniversary of the start of the trauma of their genocide. As we share with the continuing trauma of the people of Ukraine. As conflict flares up yet again in Sudan and so many other parts of the world that we rarely hear about. We bring before you, Lord, all those who are caught up in conflict. We pray, th pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who are fearful for their lives day by day those who've had to flee and make new lives as refugees, remembering particularly the welcome we owe in our own country. And we pray for the peacemakers, all those who are trying to bring warring factions together, those who are trying to bring justice where there is oppression, And in that light, we pray for the church throughout the world, that it may stand as a beacon of your light and your love, that you as risen Christ may be a symbol of reconciliation, of your reconciliation with the world, that may inspire reconciliation between human beings. We pray for places where the church itself is conflicted. We remember as the church in Rwanda has acknowledged the complicity that has often been there with the forces of hatred. The forces that wish to put nation above humanity. We pray for our own communities, for all those around us, sometimes hidden from sight, sometimes in plain view in their suffering. For families unable to feed their children adequately. For people uncertain about their futures, their employment, 
their health And we remember particularly those who have written in this prayer book, those who have brought particular concerns before you. In a moment of quiet, we'll bring our own individual concerns together in prayer. So, risen Christ, may the light of Easter shine through the world. May there be new hope, new love, and a new sense of your purpose being fulfilled. That all may know who you are, and want to be part of your purpose. All these prayers we bring in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We join in our concluding hymn number 397, The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free.
And so may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with us always. Amen.